It's great to be here and it's great to meet with you. Uh, uh, you have so much experience, both from academic life, but also as a practitioner or uh, as a, in practical uh, politics, uh, being an ambassador to uh, NATO and in uh, public life in the United States. So, so uh, uh, you have experience, you have knowledge, which we highly value in NATO. But uh, I also know that you are highly valued here at Harvard and the Kennedy School with all the knowledge and experience you bring to this uh, school. So for me, it's great to be here. And it's great to be uh, at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard because uh, Harvard is uh, one of the world's most uh, recognized and premier institutions for uh, learning, for public life. And uh, I remember very well, last time I was here, the, I was Prime Minister of Norway, and I gave a lecture on the sovereign wealth fund of Norway, uh, whether the oil revenues, uh, uh, whether, whether the oil revenue uh, for Norway is a, is a blessing or a curse. Uh, this time my topic is very different. My topic is NATO and uh, the challenges uh, NATO uh, is facing. I will, uh, I will um, uh, give you or I will deliver a speech and then afterwards I'm more than ready to and happy to answer your questions on many different uh, uh, topics. Uh, but uh, let me start with the fact that uh, the Kennedy School has uh, alumni which have served all over the world in different uh, positions as uh, prime ministers and presidents, as uh, politicians from uh, many different uh, political partner, uh, parties, and uh, as uh, ambassadors and uh, generals and admirals. And I also read that there has been some astronauts that, has, uh, uh, so, uh, um, that, that are alumni from the Kennedy uh, School. So uh, there are many people uh, who have served in different positions. And many of the people that have served in uh, NATO, they're also alumni from the Kennedy School. And I think that if we gathered all of them in a the room, uh, they could uh, tell us many different uh, tales. Uh, they could um, tell us about uh, Cuban missiles and razor-wired border posts, of velvet revolutions and the tearing down of a wall or wars halted and genocide uh, prevented. They would tell you about 9-11 and the first and only use of Article 5 of NATO's founding treaty, as Nick just referred to. Uh, treating an attack uh, uh, on one as an attack on all. A moment uh, which uh, Nick remembers very well because at that time he was the ambassador to NATO as uh, he just uh, told uh, all of us. And they would uh, speak of an organization based on the values of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, on common interest and on close friendships. They would paint the picture of an organization that constantly changes to meet the challenges of the day. Shakespeare once wrote of the seven ages of man, Today, I would like to talk about the three ages of NATO. <laughs> about where NATO has been, about how it's evolved, and about where NATO is going. The first age of NATO began 67 years ago in Washington. After the horrors of the Second World War, the countries of North America and Western Europe came together to find a new, different way forward. They realized back then that going it alone doesn't work. It never has and it never will. Going it alone had only led to centuries of war in Europe and of the United States being drawn into uh, two devastating world wars which started in Europe. By standing together through collective defense, things could be different. By being united, NATO allies could stand up to the bullies, bullies of the international arena and say no. We could protect our allies, we could protect our territory, we could protect our people. 
as a result, the following 40 years were among the most stable and certainly the most prosperous that Western Europe and North America had ever experienced. And then, in what felt uh, like a moment, the world changed. The Cold War ended without a shot being fired on European soil. The Soviet Union collapsed. The people of, Eastern, of the Eastern Bloc were free. New countries appeared as others vanished from the map and Europe rushed to be united. With many countries in Central and Eastern Europe joining NATO and the European Union. Russia, no longer an enemy, became a partner of NATO. This was a time of great optimism and hope for some, but for others it was a time of fear and violence. The wars in the Balkans in the 1990s were brutal and bloody. The threat of another genocide just half a century after the Holocaust was real. So NATO stepped up and we entered our second age. Moving from purely collective defense, NATO set its sights on managing conflicts beyond its borders, bringing an end to the war in Bosnia and later stopping potential genocide in Kosovo. This was a new role for NATO, a role we proved adept at playing. So it was no surprise that after 9-11, NATO took charge in Afghanistan too. Troops from every NATO country, from the United States, Britain, Italy, Germany, Romania, Estonia and all the other allies joined in. Troops from our partners from around the world, all joined together to eradicate Al-Qaeda, to fight the Taliban and to bring stability to Afghanistan. Together, Canada and the European allies have lost over 1,000 soldiers in that mission. A mission launched in response to an attack on the United States. And we are still in Afghanistan. Supporting the Afghan armed forces, which, helped build, which we helped build from over, almost nothing, to an effective force of more than 350,000 soldiers and police. Standing together, as we have always done, stronger together, as we have always been. Our unity was essential to managing crisis in our second age. But then, in a moment, our world changed again. That moment was 2014. It was the year that for the first time since World War II, a European country seized part of another by force. With its annexation of Crimea, Russia had torn up the international rule book that had served all nations, including itself, so well for so many years. It rejected the principles set out in the Helsinki Final Act, where all nations are sovereign and independent and should solve their differences through peaceful means, ideas that Russia has helped create. Instead, Russia looked backwards to worn out notions of spheres of influence and of strong nations having dominion over the weak. With the fate of millions of people decided by big men in the smoke-filled rooms, rooms in smoke-filled rooms, and this is an outdated vision we can never accept. 2014 was also the year that witnessed the breakthrough of the terrorist group ISIL or Daesh, combining extraordinary brutality with a twisted vision of a caliphate. ISIL has proved a destructive force in Syria and in Iraq. It is attempting to spread its influence through North Africa and around the world. And acts of terror have been committed in its name from Ankara to Orlando. So now NATO has entered its third age, an age where we must, where we must do both collective defense 
and manage crisis and promote stability beyond our borders. We do not have the luxury, luxury of uh, choosing one or the other. We must do both at the same time. And this is exactly what we are doing. We have implemented the strongest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. We will soon deploy four multinational battalions, one each to Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, led in turn by the US, Germany, Canada and United Kingdom. We will also increase our presence in Southeast Europe with the stronger multinational presence in the east of our alliance, it is clear that any action against any ally will be treated as an attack on all allies. NATO stands strong and we stand united. <clears throat> but we do not seek confrontation with Russia. The Cold War is history and it should stay history. Instead, we want a meaningful and constructive dialogue with Russia. That is why we have held two meetings this year of the NATO-Russia Council to make plain our differences and to find a way forward. And this is also why I met with Foreign Minister Lavrov a couple of days ago in New York. Because while we need more defense, we also need more dialogue with Russia. Russia is our biggest neighbor and it's here to stay. ISIL, however, is totally different. ISIL must be eradicated. Combating terrorism is an essential part of promoting stability beyond our borders. In Afghanistan and elsewhere, NATO has long played a key role in the fight against terrorism. And we are stepping up our efforts. Through the global coalition to counter ISIL, Every single NATO ally is already in the fight, standing side by side with America and our partners in the region. And that coalition is as effective as it is, thanks to the long history of cooperation brought about by decades of NATO operations and exercises. NATO's long experience in the Balkans and Afghanistan tells us that an essential ingredient of long-term stability is the strength of local forces and local institutions. That's the reason why NATO is building local capacity. And NATO is already training Iraqi officers to better fight ISIL. And we are expanding this program. We will also deploy a team to Baghdad to provide strategic advice, strategic advice and support to the Iraqi security forces. And our advanced AWACS surveillance planes uh, will provide valuable information to support the air operations of the coalition to counter ISIL uh, in uh, Syria. Of course, all of this comes at the price. Freedom has never come for free. After the Cold War, defense spending fell across the alliance. But last year, the cuts stopped. And this year, 22 NATO allies will increase defense spending in real terms. The United States uh, contributes to the collective defense of the alliance in many different ways. Financially, of course, but also by virtue of being the world's only superpower. With its nuclear weapons, its huge armed forces, and home, uh, at home and around the world. Willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to defend the nations and their allies. And its moral authority and clout as the world's richest and most powerful uh, democracy. Assuring European stability has been a central pillar of US foreign policy since World War II both to prevent conflict from leading to another global war and as the US and Europe form the world's largest trading relationship to ensure its own prosperity. NATO has been the vehicle for securing this goal 
It has given the United States a unique role, a unique influence in European affairs. And without NATO, that influence, that stability and that prosperity would, put, would be put at risk and it's something we should all try to avoid. Of course, the United States may be the guarantor of European security, but it is far from its sole provider. All allies contribute through the men and women of their armed forces, through the use of their territory and their bases, through their military equipment from satellites up in the space to submarines deep under the ocean. European allies are taking the lead in the new high readiness force we have established uh, in NATO. And the forward presence in the east of our lines, we also see European allies in the lead. And I continue to press European allies to contribute even more. In return for this commitment, every ally, including the United States, gets the unwavering support of 27 other democracies. They get tried and tested command and control and deep relationships from the soldiers on the front line to the generals calling the shots. Relationships forged over many years of working and fighting side by side. They get the most powerful, most enduring and most effective and most reliable alliance the world has ever seen. The world has changed and NATO evolves. This is the way we have kept our nation safe for almost 70 years. But while NATO evolves, it also stands true to its founding principles. That united in common cause and common values, we are stronger together than we ever could be apart. On the 12th of September 2001, the day after those horrific uh, attacks on this nation, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice received a phone call from the US ambassador to NATO, from Nick. He told her that every NATO ally stood as one with America, and that every ally was willing to defend America. On that moment, Rice would later write, it is really good to have friends. In its NATO allies, America has the best of friends, and it always will. So um, my message is that NATO is good for Europe, but it's also very good for the United States. And that's the reason why we are so proud of the transatlantic bond. Thank you.